This is Podcast Andy, and today we're going to be talking about whether or not added sugars are really as sweet as they taste. So to start off, mankind has always been notorious for picking and choosing what drugs and naturally occurring substances are bad or good. Uh, This is done out of an innate drive to have the whole tribe or population prosper, because I'm sure anyone listening would like their family to prosper and grow. You know, they're going to pick the things that help them prosper and grow. And the only error that as a whole entire population we face is often we miss out on some substances, meaning we miss out how good they are. And then with other substances, we let them get out of hand because they're really not that good. And we just kind of let it happen. We let it happen because of, I don't know, taste? or things like what they do to your body. And one foolproof example of a substance which is which is use has gotten out of control is sugar. Yes, sugar, the sugar that you guys eat every single day. According to Dr. Sarah Godfrey, sugar is the number one most abused substance in America. I'm gonna give you a second to Take that in. Did you take it in yet? Because sugar is the number one abused substance in America when considering every substance in America. So, first of all, we're going to start with how did sugar use grow to this absurd amount of abuse? Because number one abuse in America, Americans love to abuse substances. But being number one, that is ridiculously out of control. So to start off, sugar in the 1400s, it was a sheer novelty. No one ate it. No one drank it. Ever. I mean, maybe once a year. This was... This was crazy rare. No one ate or drank sugar. And then, this all changed when Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. No, I'm just kidding, people. In actuality, the consumption of sugar didn't skyrocket until the ill-famed triangle trade triangle trade started. And the triangle trade was Europe would bring processed goods and materials for slaves, and those slaves would be transported to the Americas. And America would trade them for sugar, and the sugar would stay in the colonies as well as go back to Europe for things like molasses and to add to beer and such. The triangular trade made sugar far easier to obtain, not only for the colonists that moved over, but for Europeans, for Africans, pretty much everyone in the entire world had an easier way to obtain sugar thanks to the triangular trade, which kind of started how it is going today. And with technology also advancing, They were able to add sugar to drinks and food, leading to sugar being in the majority of foods today. With the access to sugar being inflated, the use also increased exponentially, which is, I mean, obvious. You know, that's an easy thing to connect because if there's a good that everyone loves and you can get it far easier, the use is most likely going to go up especially if people don't outright see the negative effects of sugar. And the triangular trade started the sugar epidemic that currently plagues 70% of American adults. Let me read that again. The triangle trade started the sugar epidemic that currently plagues 70% of American adults. That's more than two-thirds, people. That's an insane amount. And sugar leads to things that really negatively affect Americans today. Here's a study. According to Dr. Mercola, in a study in 2013, one in five deaths in America are related to obesity. Obesity is the disease that allows deadly disease and chronic pain to creep into a person's life. So obesity is pretty much like a, a breakdown of your wall of defense in your body. If someone were to be in great shape and a flu virus were to come, they most likely would fight it off. But if they're obese and their body already had to deal with all the extra pain and load and all those extra cells, 
the likelihood of them fighting that disease is strongly diminished. The link to obesity and all these hair diseases is metabolic dysfunction. A great number of indicators point towards metabolic dysfunction being initiated and worsened by added sugars with processed fructose being the butcher, meaning that added sugars causes metabolic dysfunction, which is a part in your body, most likely the kidney, instead of just processing sugar for energy and things of such, it processes it straight into fat, which also leads to this part of your body using sugars in the wrong way all the time with the majority of added sugars being hidden in food that we that as a nation we consume daily kicking our high intake will be nearly impossible and the issue is that fructose is more easily metab metabolized into fat than any other sugars for example the daily maximum that the Heart Association says a grown male should consume is 150 calories or 37.5 grams of sugar a day. To put that into perspective for you guys, a 20 ounce bottle of Mountain Dew contains 77 grams of sugar and a 24 ounce bottle of sweet tea contains on average 72 grams of sugar, which is far more, almost double the 37.5 grams of sugar that we should be having for the entire day. And people drink Mountain Dews for one meal. These are two of the most commonly sought after beverages in America and both contain around double the maximum recommended by the American Heart Association. For more reference, if someone sat down to snack on Oreos and managed to ingest only three, they will consume 14 grams of sugar, which is nearly one third the recommended maximum amount of sugar someone could take in for an entire day. An entire day, if someone had three Oreos, I don't know anyone that has the self-control to sit down and eat three Oreos. I know when I personally sit down to eat Oreos, I end up consuming a very large amount, like usually a whole row which contains about eight or nine, which would already put me at my daily maximum for sugar intake, which would be one snack in the entire day of all the things I will consume. With Americans using sugar every day because of a crave for the taste, just to feel more awake and a desire to experience a temporary boost of energy among other things. High sugar use should be considered a food addiction. It shouldn't just be considered, oh, I'm eating some sugar. You are addicted to that sugar because you could eat other foods, but it's just not as intriguing. In no way am I trying to proclaim that added sugar's negative effects surpass a drug's negative side effects in a substance like cocaine or other class A restricted substances. However, sugar dependence is an issue that is problematic for a human being's overall health. According again to Dr. Mercola, overindulging on sugar often leads to obesity, diabetes, heart damage or failure, cancer cell production, depletion of brain power, shortened lifespans, just to name a few. All of these negative side effects aren't from things like cocaine, which very likely cocaine could have those same side effects, but they're from added sugar, something that is in almost all foods in America today, and something that every American most likely consumes on a daily basis, if not an hourly basis. Sugar dependence starts with craving for sugar. This craving, when fulfilled, results in the firing of naturally, natural opioids in one's brain releasing dopamine. Dopamine is the same thing released and is very similar to the discharge a brain sends off when on cocaine. So sugar not only tastes good, but it creates a small reaction that is extremely similar in brain activity to things like cocaine, which is definitely a class A restricted substance and we aren't allowed to get our hands on in America. Due to our ancestors not having high sugar diets, our DNA is not programmed for such a large intake of sugar that comes with something like a candy bar. Something as simple as a candy bar. That's a snack again, people. A snack. And our DNA is not programmed for the large intake of sugar that comes in that candy bar. The result of seeking substance in a food high in sugar is an excessive reward signal being sent out by the brain. This translates to our brain subconsciously directly linking sugar to pleasure. Anything that is linked to pleasure in your, pleasure in your brain, you will want to seek out 
more times than not seek out. And the only issue with this is that our time, that over time, our own abuse of sugar, our receptors have been tasked and weakened. Which means that, sure, as a five-year-old, if you have a box of nerds, you're going to be bouncing off the walls. But as a 45-year-old, if you have a box of nerds, it's going to be like no effect on you. And that is because your receptors have been weakened by the over-abuse of sugar. That's why you only see kids getting sugar rushes, because over that time, they've completely destroyed the reactors in the brain to where to feel that same rush, they're going to need so much more sugar. This tolerance is what causes Americans and all people to want more and more sugar in their diets. Whenever people have huge sugar intakes, try to scale back on their sugar input, they go into minuscule withdrawals. With tolerance and withdrawals playing a substantial role in our sugar intake, the likelihood of this epidemic going away is slim to none. Now let me say again people, tolerance and withdrawals are two things that directly link to sugar intake. Those are not two things that people often refer to when they think about added sugars, but things that they often refer to when talking about class A drug drugs that are restricted. The solution to this issue is not the eradication of sugar in no way. The solution is a vast decrease in the amount of sugar consumed. I'm not going to come at you guys with a huge problem and not try and name at least a few solutions. So I'm going to go with this can be done with a few proven methods. And when I say proven, I mean proven methods. The first is to not fall into the sort of emotional eating that regularly happens. You know, your boyfriend breaks up with you, you get all sad, you eat a tub, a huge tub of ice cream. That's going to have so much added sugar, and that's going to ruin your receptors. So when you're just having a drink or something, you're going to think that, oh, I need to also eat a lot of sugar with this meal, otherwise I'm not going to feel that rush. And that's all going to be made subconsciously, so that will happen. People have repeatedly fall into a trap of using food as a therapist, eating horribly, following a crummy day to feel some sort of relief that rarely works people you're just going to feel more crummy in about 30 minutes fighting falling into an emotional eating is crucial to a healthy body as well as a healthy mind two things that are essential to overall bliss and overall happiness next when eating a set diet one needs to take into mind one's size if someone is already morbidly obese one should not try to jump into a minimal sugar 2,000 calorie diet, which means that on a 2,000 calorie diet, you'd have 5% sugar. One's body needs more substance and should take that into account when set dieting. Because if you're already that large and you try to make that jump, maybe you'll be able to do it for a week, but after that week, you will no longer be able to move or survive. And what that's going to do is cause you to crash on your diet and burn on your diet, and you're going to eat a huge amount of food and go back to the way you were, which will put you either where you were or worse than where you were. So if you're already on a 5,000 calorie diet, try scaling that back to a 4,500 calorie diet, and in two weeks, start moving it down by 500 every two weeks until you hit 2,000 and then stay there. Or maybe even until you hit 1,500 and stay there. That's something that you would want to consult with a doctor, but I would highly recommend to lower your sugar intake. Because if you are having a giant amount, and when I say giant, I mean like a 4,000 calorie diet, then the likelihood that is out of sugars is still going to be 5%. So that 5% on a 4,000 calorie diet is double what you should be having in a day. And the likelihood is if you're having 4,000 calories, a lot of those are bad calories, and bad calories often have a large amount of added sugars. And those added sugars are just horrible for your body. And lastly, a great way to solve the sugar epidemic is exercising. Exercising can lead to one's body burning sugar for energy instead of transfusing it into things like fat. If you actually work out often, when you eat sugar, your kidney will transform all of that sugar into energy. And if it's not used, it will get out of your body through things like sweat and pee and of the such. Or you'll just use the energy up in ways just by sitting down. You'll burn those calories. But if you don't exercise, your body will automatically turn those things into fat. And by things, I mean sugar. And that is not going to look good in pictures or on you. So when setting one's diet with the harmful effects of sugar in mind, people think high fructose corn syrup is a healthy alternative. 
corn syrup became a popular alternative to sugar in the 1970s due to sugar prices soaring and prices of corn being decreased. It is made by corn being milled to produce cornstarch and soon after processed further to produce corn syrup. Corn syrup can contain up to 90% fructose, but the most common version is 55% fructose with the rest being glucose. Now people think, Andy, explain to me, what's the difference? So here I'm going to go and I'm going to explain the difference between the two. The most common version being comparable to sugar on the grounds that sugar is half fructose, half glucose. Table sugar is dry and granulated, where corn syrup is a liquid. High fructose particles do not bind together, as seen in sugar, instead floating alongside each other. High fructose corn syrup resembles sugar in the sense that both are consumed on both, both are composed of both fructose and glucose. In fact, when sugar and corn syrup are broken down in our digestive tract, they look nearly indistinguishable. The issue being that high fructose corn syrup is often the variety not used confused of 55% fructose and 45% glucose. Meaning that if you get the most common variety, yeah, it's going to be about as bad for you as added sugars would be. But the likelihood is that you're in a thing like candy, you'll get an 80% fructose variety, which is often far worse for you. When it comes to sweets, our body would far prefer breaking down glucose. The liver is the only organ that can process large amounts of fructose, and when it gets overloaded, it transforms the fructose into fat. Some of the fat can lodge in the liver, generating a fatty, less effective liver. No one wants a less effective organ. That's almost ridiculous to seek after, and that's almost ridiculous to not treat. Uh, this overuse of fructose can lead to all different kinds of adverse health conditions. I know you may be thinking, fructose is in fruits as well, how could it be that bad for you? That is true, but high levels of fructose negatively affect your body only when fructose comes from added sugars. Whole fruits come with plenty of fibers and antioxidants that quarrel with the negative backlash of fructose. Furthermore, high fructose corn syrup with large amounts of fructose is far worse for the body than table sugars. However, when comparing high fructose corn syrup with only 55% fructose to the results, they're almost akin to table sugar. So table sugar and high fructose corn syrup are equivalently harmful to the body only if you choose the less potent versions of corn syrup. So again, this leads to obesity that plagues America. I've personally been to many different countries, and I think about how skinny the majority of people are. In my journeys to India, Canada, Mexico, Germany to name a few, I have not seen the mass obesity walking around that I often see in the streets of my hometown here in Springfield, Missouri. And obesity is not only a problem in Springfield, I've personally been in cities all over America, and morbidly obese people are a recurring phenomenon. America is the 12th most obese country in the world according to the World Atlas, and this is surprising, except for the given truth that we're the number one most obese country when it comes to massive countries in the world. The problem that hits our society is that we use 90% of more high tooth foreign corn syrup than any other major country in the world. So scientists know that this is not a good thing for you, but we continue to use it just because of taste, kind of like the American way, to take something that we know is right and say, you know what, we know better. The doctors don't know. And as a society that rebels against strenuous labor and things like that, we thrive off the fast food industry, that is going to lead to uh, obesity being a problem in America for a very long time unless we make direct, decisive changes. The only promising thing is that our most consumed drink as a nation has moved from soda to water. This is a transition that should be beneficial to Americans' health. The drink of choice has shifted from the 1990s due to informing people about the negative health effects of pop. The reason this is so oppressive is that we could do the exact same thing with sugar if we find the drive to do so. Keep that in mind, people. The most popular drink in America was soda. And then there was a very large media movement that said soda's bad for you. And now the most consumed drink in America is water. If we were to do this in sugar, I have no doubt in my mind that we could do this. If we could do this with something like pop, we can do this with something like sugar. So lastly, I'm going to end this off and say, as a nation, we need to educate each other on the adverse effects of high fructose corn syrup and added sugars in general. We need to make a decisive stand against added sugars and a beneficial movement toward better overall health. It can no more just be doctors informing patients. The people that people listen to are most usually the ones that are idolized and the people's family. 
So if everyone can tell one family member about the negative effects of added sugars, and all the stars in the world can take a stand against added sugars, then as a nation we can shred off those excess pounds and shred off the unhealthy lifestyle that, has become, that everyone has become accustomed to here in America. So I'd like to thank everyone for listening today. Again, this is Podcast Andy, and I hope to catch you next time.